Today I have my first filling ever. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel and welcome to the video. If you are new here, my name is Steven and I am a third year dental student. Today I'm doing my first filling ever on a live patient and I'm super excited about it. I also have an appointment in the afternoon so it's gonna be a busy day. But instead of making this a vlog and forcing myself to kind of film throughout while talking about everything that I'm doing, I'm essentially gonna bring you along with me, film everything that I'm doing, and then do a voiceover after the fact so I can just better explain the process of today. I'm doing a class five filling on one of my favorite patients and I'm pumped about it. So without further ado, let's get inside the Dunn Dental Building and get to work on another very busy day in clinic. <music> Welcome to the editing studio and let's get into the details of this filling. The beginning of the process of any appointment is the setup of the cubicle. Now in dental school, we do all of our own setup and breakdown. That's one of the differences between dental school and being out in private practice. For an operative appointment, it is standard protocol in terms of infection control. We basically cover everything that we're gonna touch or that we might touch with a barrier. So we're basically covering everything with plastic. After getting my infection control of the cubicle figured out, I will head up to the fifth floor where I'm gonna get all of my sterilized instruments. For this appointment, there are going to be three cassettes that I grab. The first is a handpiece cassette. I'm gonna be using a high-speed handpiece in this procedure. The second is my operative cassette, which has all of the various instruments, uh, hand instruments that I would use in an operative procedure to do a variety of different fillings. And the third cassette is my dental dam cassette, and that's going to have the elements for putting on a rubber dam or a dental dam, which we use at UTHSC in all of our operative appointments unless it's something that's really uh, strange or unique. I'm also gonna grab my start check box, which has everything from my blood pressure cuff to payment forms and patient eyeglasses for protection. I'm also grabbing my ErgoPrism loops from Lumident. These are loops I've talked about multiple times in the past. I really enjoy using these loops for procedures like operative or fixed, where I'm focused in on one area of the mouth. Daisy's upset. And then the last box that I'm grabbing is sort of a fixed slash operative kit, which has my composite instruments and some other things that I might use in an operative procedure. All of that is from my fourth floor locker, which is the non-sterile locker. The armamentarium here is relatively simple. We have the classic elements that we always have in every appointment, which is the patient uh, bib. We have some gauze. I always grab a little bit extra just in case. Uh, we have some cotton rolls, some cotton pellets, and then we have occlusal registration strips. We have extra feather lights, which are little composite finishing discs that we use in these procedures. And then also we importantly have our anesthesia. So we start with We start with 20% benzocaine, which is a topical uh, local anesthetic. We put that on the area of the injection, and then we inject our actual local anesthetic, which is given to us by our professor that we're working with. Additionally, I have some specific components here for the composite process, so etch, bond, the composite itself, and then a couple extra things like dental dam lube, the dental dam itself, alcohol prep pads, all of these things. Let's get into the specifics of the appointment itself. The first aspect of the process is getting the patient seated in the chair and discussing what we're gonna be doing today. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video today, we were doing a class five composite filling on tooth number 20. This tooth had a little bit of a lesion at the gum line. It was likely the result of toothbrush abrasion. So I think the patient was brushing too hard and over time that cervical portion of the enamel broke down, a little bit of the root dentin was even exposed. You had a little bit of gingival recession. It was kind of the classic case for a class five as a result of toothbrush abrasion. And we were just going to be excavating a little bit, defining a bit of a classic class five cavity prep and then filling it with composite. So after seating the patient and going through the start check, which is essentially blood pressure, a couple of questions about the medical history, just updating everything for that particular procedure, I was able to begin with the anesthesia process. As I mentioned a second ago, it begins with the administration of topical benzocaine, which just slightly numbs the soft tissues that we're going to inject. And that makes the experience of having an injection somewhat more enjoyable for the patient. If we can get some of that tissue a little bit numb, 
it's maybe not gonna be as bad when the needle goes in. So we do that first. And then in this case, I was working on a lower tooth, specifically a lower second premolar. And so the injection that is indicated here is an inferior alveolar nerve block. And this is a really common one that we give all the time. In my opinion, it is the most technique sensitive. It's the most difficult, but everybody says when you do it 50 times, or even maybe less than that, you just figure it out and it's you start hitting it. Full transparency here, I gave my patient one carpule of lidocaine in this case, and she wasn't really feeling numb. She was telling me that, you know, maybe I'm starting to feel a little bit, like a little bit of tingly, whatever. And I told her, when you feel numb, you're gonna know that you feel numb. Your entire face feels puffy and I promise you'll know. So I gave her one injection and then I told the professor that I was working with that she wasn't really getting numb after five to 10 minutes of waiting. So he came in and he gave her a second carpule. And after that, she got profoundly numb as she was supposed to. It's important in these scenarios, if you're like me and you miss an injection, to watch the professor when they go in and administer an injection themselves. See where they put the needle, see what they do with the soft tissue to get it out of the way, and, and just look for the anatomy and the, the landmarks that they're shooting for. When the professor went in and hit the injection himself, I noticed that he was much more lateral and much more superior than I was. I had been a little bit more towards the midline, more medial, and I'd also been a little bit more inferior of the area that I needed to be. This is all the process of learning injections. I am by no means good at it yet, I would say. Specifically with the IA block, that one is, like I said, the toughest. With the other ones, it's a little bit simpler. You just shoot for the roots and you'll get it. But with this one, I'm still learning and I wanted to be fully transparent with you and describe the process of missing it and having to ask the teacher for help. They're trying to get the procedure done, so they will give the anesthesia if they have to. After that, the next step was prepping the actual restoration. So I went in and just excavated a little bit with a 330 burr and a high speed hand piece. Pretty simple there, just with a class five, we're creating a little bit of what looks like a smiley face in the cervical portion of the tooth. Mine was opened up a little bit more than your ideal preparation would be just because of the extent of the tooth brush abrasion. So what we wanted to do was open up that area excavate any area of dentin that felt kind of soft, and then also make sure that we had proper retention for the eventual restoration that we would place. Of course, we're placing a composite, so we do have a little bit of that micro mechanical or I don't know, chemical retention, they probably wouldn't call it that, but we do want to have some sort of physical retention in the way that the tooth is actually prepped so that the composite has a lower chance of ever coming out, especially down there at the gum line. Once the prep was finished, we etched, which is a phosphoric acid etch. We do that in all composite uh, restorations. We then applied Scotch Bond, that's what we use at my school, to help with the bonding of the composite restoration to the tooth itself. And then we went in and added the composite and then we finished. So that's kind of the standard protocol, the standard procedure. When you add the composite to the prep, you wanna take your time and make sure that you get as perfect a contour as you can while the composite is still pliable before you actually go in there and light cure. Once I light cured, the restoration looked great, super gingival, because I was able to kind of compress the margins into the tooth structure. But when I went in with an explorer, I could feel clicking at basically the entire uh, subgingival margin of the restoration. And that's something we don't want. If we have a restoration that goes subgingival, dives under the gums, we wanna make sure that it's very, very smooth with the margins or else we're going to cause inflammation in the tissue and the overlying tissue. And that's not great, we do not want that. Oh, the other thing that you get is you get uh, food traps. So you get particles uh, that form plaque, bacteria gets trapped under there, eventually calculus, and that further leads to the inflammation of the tissue, leads to recession, leads to gingivitis, periodontitis eventually. Those are things that we want to avoid. So you have to make sure using the Explorer that you feel for clicks in that subgingival margin of the restoration, and you get in there and you smooth it out. I had to spend quite a bit of time with sort of a flame-shaped carbide burr is what I was using and just really refining that subgingival margin slowly. Of course, the burr is down in the sulcus of the patient, so there is a little bit of bleeding. Thankfully, this patient was very healthy, had very healthy gums, so it wasn't a ton of bleeding, but the composite is in fact cured at this point, so really it's okay if you have that bleeding, and it's honestly to be expected at this point. In terms of finishing the restoration, we wanna get a nice solid polish and shine on the restoration to make sure that it looks good when it's finished, and I was able to do this with the feather light system System. It's my preference in terms of finishing composites. They have the little discs, they're like green and gray, 
and I like them better than some of the other ones, but they do have like the, the pogo system as well. And there's a bunch of other options. So you want to play around with those when you go to start doing your restorations yourself. But the main thing that I was happy with in the restoration was the color or shade match. I thought the shade was absolutely perfect. It's something that we had tested with this patient in the past. We were making this patient whitening trays. And so I had already tested the shade on the day of the restoration. I tested it again just to make sure that my shade match was perfect. And once we placed the composite, it looked identical to the tooth structure. Patient was super, super excited about that. And especially with something that's a little bit more cosmetic, like a class five, Yes, it's a second premolar. It's kind of back there a little bit, almost to the buccal corridor area, but we do want to get as close a shade match as possible. And that was something that we were able to get in this appointment, which I was super happy with. Also, the margins of the restoration were great. The professor that I worked with said that they were good. He liked them. So it was uh, a good positive. I see Daisy in the background. She's Margins look great, the shade match was great, the patient was really, really happy with the way that it looked, which once again is very, very important. We want our patients to appreciate the finish and the way that something looks cosmetically. They're not necessarily going to be able to know the ins and outs of the function of the restoration, but if it looks good, Generally speaking, they're gonna be happy. After dismissing the patient who was super, super content, and that was great, it was just cleaning up the cubicle, making sure that everything is wiped down and disinfected for the next student doctor who would be coming to that cubicle to use it, throwing away everything that was trash that we used, and then taking all of the instruments that I used back to our sterilization folks, for them to sterilize for my next time that I need to use those instruments. And that was really it for that appointment. As I said, things turned out great on this one. Yes, I missed the injection, but that's something to be expected with an IA block. That's a difficult one, and I wasn't surprised when I missed it. But everything else went really well. The patient loved the restoration. The teacher was happy with the way I finished the margins. Everything subgingival was nice and tight, and uh, there was no clicks or anything like that. So I think the long-term health of the patient's gums with this particular restoration is good. I think she has a good prognosis there. You know, it's composite, I'm not sure how long it'll last because all composites do fail eventually, but hopefully with the isolation process, something I didn't even talk about, the application of the dental dam, which we do, I, I had help from my assistant in doing that. The isolation process and then also the etching and bonding Hopefully all of that process and the care that I and my assistant put into that will allow for a lengthy, lengthy run for that restoration for my patient. That was my first ever filling. It was an awesome, awesome experience. I tell you what, it was the first thing I've done in dental school where I genuinely, genuinely felt like a dentist. I've done a lot of things leading up to this filling. I've done a lot of appointments. I've had plenty of different things that I've done for various patients, but actually cutting on a tooth with a handpiece on a real patient uh, you know, giving an injection, all of that stuff felt really, really real for me. And it was just another one of those pinch me moments where I realized that I'm actually doing what I want to do with my life. And I am, it's such a dream for me to be in this position as a student in a dental school. It's absolutely awesome. And for all of you watching, I know all of you are going to succeed. I know all of you are eventually going to become dentists yourselves. You will have that same pinch me moment the first time you cut a cavity preparation on a real patient. Make sure the patient selection is good. Make sure you get a good patient to work with for this first filling, something that you think you can do a reasonable restoration. Mine was pretty simple and pretty straightforward. And once again, a good patient that you think will take to the treatment well. Those are kind of surefire ways to have a good experience the first time you do one of these restorations. And friends, that's all I'm going to say in this video. Thank you for joining me in this journey of learning how to place my first restoration. It was fun and I hope to do more of these videos in the future. I can't really film a whole lot in the clinic, but I can sit here in my home and talk about it. If you enjoyed this format and you wanna see more of this in the future, my first crown prep, my first denture, whatever it is you wanna see, please let me know in the comments that you enjoyed this video and I promise you I will do more of these in the future. Have a blessed day. Good luck with the studying, whatever you're doing in this month of September, almost October. Go Vols, Tennessee football, killing it right now, 3-0. and Got Florida next week. I'm really excited about that. And friends, as I always say at the end of my videos, I will see you in the next one.